I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Keep it up. 
In fact, there are certain geese, depending on where you are and in the line there, that that's your job, is to encourage other geese to keep on going. You saw geese the other day? Me too. You know, geese kind of remind me of a church. Well, as geese, we all help each other out, right? We're all, we encourage each other. And every goose is just as important as the other goose. That means that all of you here are just as important in this church as everyone that's sitting here. You're just as important as the pastor. Kind of need to think about it, huh? And because we're all a church and we're all a family together, we encourage each other. Now, we don't honk at each other, right? We don't, we're people. We don't honk. How do we encourage each other?
your very end. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against us. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much blood that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood and said to the nobles, the officials of the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. Fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did, work, did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. The man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn until the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night, so they can serve us as guards by night and work it by day. Neither I, nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me, took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. This is the word of our God. Our epistle lesson is Romans chapter 13, the first ten verses. This is our second to last in a series of going through the book of Romans. Do you remember who was emperor of Rome during the time of Paul? Emperor Nero. Emperor Nero was not known for being a nice and sane individual, especially when it came to the Christians. It's reported that he at one time set Christians or dipped Christians in oil and used them as lamps in his courtyard. So if there was anybody that Christians shouldn't listen to, it should be Nero, right? And yet, Paul here tells them not to counter Nero's hatred with their own hatred, but to counter Nero's hatred with love and obedience, showing that they were on God's side, that they were in the right to counter hatred Love. We read for Romans chapter 13. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right and for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you, for he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, making the wrath and bring punishment on the wrong word. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no doubt debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandments there may be, are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. This is the word of God. Hallelujah. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Hallelujah.
faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our words of meditation this morning are from Nehemiah chapter 4, continuing in our sermon series and taking a look at the book of Nehemiah. Dear brothers and sisters, in Nehemiah chapter 3, we rejoice with Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem as they began to work on the building projects of rebuilding the wall. We saw a fired up team get to work. We saw a team gather from various locations, various locations, various families, all come together as one to work on this seemingly impossible task of rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. Now in chapter 4, we see that news of their success is starting to get out. People were starting to notice what was going on in Jerusalem. It's true, isn't it, that when God does his work, when, when God works in a church, or in a people, or in a home, or in an individual's life, people notice. If Shepherd of the Hills continues on with his building project, people are going to notice that. Every time we take a step forward as a church or as an individual in our life of sanctification, people are going to notice. Well, that's what's happening here in Nehemiah chapter 4. People noticed something was happening in Jerusalem. They noticed the piles of rubble of stone that had encircled and defined the beaten down city of Jerusalem. Well, it wasn't looking quite the same anymore. Suddenly, the city was starting to look like a city again. Suddenly, the walls were starting to appear, and the people seemed to be filled with a new purpose and pride. Jerusalem was hopping. Things were happening. And people were noticing. Sanballat noticed he was an enemy from Samaria to the north of Jerusalem. Tobiah noticed he was an enemy from Ammon to the east of Jerusalem. Geshem noticed he was an enemy from the south of Jerusalem. We've seen all those guys in previous chapters, but now we see that the Ashdodites have arrived, and they noticed they were the Philistines from west of the city. From all sides, from every direction, from north to south, to east to west, people noticed what was happening in Jerusalem. And these people were enemies of the work in Jerusalem. They were enemies of the people of God and of God himself. They were enemies from without. And we can learn a lot from their response. In spite of the enemies from without, though, in spite of their opposition, the wall continued to grow. This chapter marks the halfway point of the rebuilding of the wall. And depending on what section of the wall you were working on, that could be anywhere up to four and a half stories high. Sadly, something even more insidious started to happen. In addition to the enemies from without, enemies started to appear within. The old enemies of the weariness discouragement and fear reared their ugly heads and posed an even greater threat than the Samaritans, the Ammonites, the Arabs, or the Ashdodites combined. Now we're faced with such a withering assault from within and from without. Some wanted to throw them top. Some wanted to let this project of rebuilding the wall just die a quiet death. Some wanted to just just as Sanballat attacked the people of Jerusalem with ridicule and opposition, you and I need to expect that same kind of ridicule and opposition in our walk with God. Nehemiah and his people were not the first to undergo this kind of treatment. There are plenty of examples in the Bible of people being mocked for their faith. The one that comes to mind for me is David and Goliath. Goliath and the Philistines constantly mocking Jerusalem, constantly putting them down, finding David and having 
off of it. And he goes out to meet Goliath in battle, a teenage boy. And what does Goliath do? He mocks him. Calls him a dog. How about Jesus on trial? And during one of the moth moments in the trial, Jesus is in captivity. And what's happening to him? He's being mocked and beaten by the Roman soldiers that were guarding him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. Or when Jesus is on the cross, the people standing below are saying, If you are the Son of God, then come down from that cross. Then we'll believe you. And not only the people on the ground, but the person next to him. Meanwhile, 
about the people in Judah said. <coughs> Discouragement started first within the royal tribe of Judah. They had David's blood in their veins. You would think that they would have had more faith and more courage than the rest of the tribes. They were looked upon as leaders, as the pace setters. <coughs> so if the tribe of Judah was bummed out, then the other tribes would be more inclined to give up on the project as well. The first cause of internal discouragement was just plain old fatigue. The strength of the laborers is giving out, Judah said. Simply put, they were tired. <coughs> They're hitting hard and they needed some rest. The phrase giving up gives the idea of, of staggering, of tottering, of, of stumbling around. Well, you and I know this. When you and I are physically drained, it's very easy to become discouraged at the slightest problem. It's also interesting to know when the workers became fatigued and discouraged. Verse 6 says that the wall is at half the height that it should be at. Many times when we start a new project, the first half goes real quickly because we're excited. But when the newness starts to wear off and the work becomes routine, then it becomes boring, then it's easy to become fatigued. And when you're and when it's easy to, and when you're tired, it's easy to become discouraged and to begin to think that you're never going to finish the job. The people of Judah said, we can't rebuild the wall. They're ready to throw the towel. These are the same people who just four verses earlier are described as those who work with all their heart. They got frustrated. Verse 10 continues by saying that there is so much rubble that they cannot rebuild the wall. They became so discouraged because it was such an aggravating situation. I'm sure that everywhere they turned, they were just finding old broken rocks that they couldn't use, dried out the mortar, just debris everywhere, the same old thing every day, picking up rocks and putting it into a new place. This junk was everywhere. And it was frustrating. Just as they lost sight of the goal, so too we can lose sight of the goal when we've got too much junk and rubble and garbage in our own. <laughs> Hebrews 12 verse 1 challenges us to get rid of anything that may cause us to get frustrated in our pursuit of righteousness. It's, the Bible says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with endurance the race marked out for us. Now I don't know what the rubble is in your life. It may be the types of entertainment you enjoy. It might be a possession that you're holding on to. It might be an unhealthy relationship. Is there a sin that you've been playing around with for too long? You have a problem with drinking or drugs, or are you involved in some other kind of entanglement that is tripping you up? Something you've been doing in secret that no one else knows about? As the writer of the Hebrews says, throw it off so you don't get tripped up. <clears throat> Finally, the people of Israel were afraid. The enemies of the Lord's work had struck fear in the hearts of God's people, and they felt like they were nothing. Remember what they said. We cannot rebuild the wall. Now, listen to what Nehemiah says to them. He says, Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. The people of were getting discouraged because they had gotten their focus all out of whack. They were focused on the enemy's threats, on the piles of rubble and all the work that was left to be done. Nehemiah rightly redirects them to focus on the Lord, who is great and awesome, and the things that were at stake if they yielded to the enemy name with their families. When opposition hits, it's easy to get your focus off the Lord and on to your problems. At such times, stand and stop and say with Paul, set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. Well, what are the things that are above that we should keep our eyes focused on? 
like Nehemiah, we remember our God who is great and awesome. Our God who created the heavens and the earth. Our God who brought us into his kingdom. A kingdom whose walls will never fail and whose walls will never be breached by the enemy. Our God is love for us. Even when we were steeped in the rebellion of our sin, he fought against sin, death, and the devil. Focus on Jesus, who didn't fatigue on his mission of saving you. He bravely and willingly took on your sins, took your sins onto himself while he was nailed to the cross, while he was being mocked. All of our doubt and our discouragement, all those times that you question what in the world are you doing, God? The times that you succumb to the pressures of Satan. Jesus died for those. And now he says to each one of us here individually, I forgive you, I love you. This same Jesus rose from the dead after conquering death. And tell me, what other king can put that on? <laughs> That's a king that I know that I can trust, that I can rely on. Just like Nehemiah says, our God will fight for us. Now earlier I mentioned how <coughs> the soldiers or the crowds mocked Jesus. We see in our text Nehemiah and the Israelites getting mocked and almost succumbing to all the pressure. You and I are going to be mocked. We will face the temptation of giving up and cowering in fear. But I want you to think about this for the moment. How did the story of David and Goliath end up? Who won? How did the story of Jesus end up? Who won? God always wins in the end. When our king returns on Judgment Day, everyone will know that our God always wins. No one can stand against his holiness and against his awesome power. That is your God. Your king. Rely on him. Trust in him. Because he will fight you. Amen. Please stand as we sing with King David. <coughs> the Creative Me, which is on page 7.
O oh Lord our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church and all the world that your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. We bring you our request for the various structures of our society, plus our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness for their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in the workmanship. Help us on our satisfaction and all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your, as your representatives. Give us to love one another as you have loved us. And Lord, in our special prayers today, we ask that you be with Bill Carter, who had a pacemaker put in yesterday and continues to recover at the hospital. Give him the sure hope that you are with him always to the very end of the age. Bless his doctors and nurses as they continue to do, uh, help him to recover, and may he worship with us again very shortly. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught, with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace.
our calendars for our fall work days, which will be Saturday, October 11th at 9 a.m. Lunch will be provided to help us to get our church ready for the fall and winter months. Through our senior outreach to assistant living centers, a few of the directors have let me know to us that there are some people who are lonely and can use a visit. Uh, we're looking for three women and two men who might have some time to visit you know, once a week, once every other week or so. Uh, if that's possible for you, uh, please see Jerry Rexon. Jerry, you want to raise your hand? I hear the numbers. Hills highlights are available out on the usher stands. After the 10.30 service here, please take time to greet one another uh, in the back of the fellowship. Uh, one other quick note. Uh, traditionally, when the candles are lit, uh, that's a time for us to uh, prepare ourselves for worship. So uh, before church starts, I just ask that we kind of keep the noise volume lower uh, in the church. We want to talk. Uh, more please wait till afterwards or go out into the hallway. But when the candles are lit, that's kind of a sign that uh, we begin to meditate on worship. Finally, we have a lost connection for this for this one. I ought to say this is one of my favorites because it's about my alma mater, Luther Prep School. As you can probably know, we have one school up in Saginaw, Michigan Lutheran Seminary, which is no longer a seminary, it's just a high school. Uh, but it's run by our city. We have another high school that's run by our city in Watertown, Wisconsin. That's what this one's about. They're celebrating their 150th anniversary. So let's take a look at that. Just over half of the graduates here go on to Martin. 
with the child. A significant number of young men go to refer to Wisconsin Lutheran Center to become pastors. For 150 years, Prep has been the main theater for our pastors, and uh, we're doing a great job of that for our years. Not all of Prep's graduates go on to the full time ministry, but every student here has received the benefit of a quality education focused on God's work and experience that will serve them for the rest of their lives. One of my best friends, he decided he's not going to go to LLC, but like he's fine with that and I know it's a good decision. And whatever he does, I think we'll be prepared for all of them. Yeah. When you graduate, you know that you have the gift to serve God in whatever you do. It doesn't have to be in the ministry. It can be in your everyday life or whatever job you decide to do. If the past is a guide, most of our future church leaders will pass through these halls, part of a ministerial education system that has served our churches for a century and a half.